Hi, I'm Howie Rose, and welcome to this edition of One on One, where today we chat with a fellow who is part of the 2000 National League champion New York Mets and is generally known as one of the best pinch hitters in the history of the game, and that is Lenny Harris. Hello, Lenny. Nice Hello. to see you again. Nice to be here. You know, I, I give you that introduction, and I wonder whether or not, deep down inside, you're a kid, you want to become a Major League Baseball player, you achieve that dream, you play for about eight different teams, you're in a couple of World Series, and the first thing people think of when they hear Lenny Harris is great pinch hitter. Is there a part of you that says, come on, man, I was more than a pinch hitter. Well, I hear, I hear it a lot. People always bring it up to my attention, but that's what I left my stone at. You know, I just finished up strong, and people notice me as an all-time pitch hit leader of Major League Baseball. But, you know, just playing every day, you know, I had fun doing it, I guess. You know, just when I got traded to the Dodgers, you know, Tommy looked at me one day, said, you're not playing today. And I always wonder why I wasn't playing. So I came off the bench one time and, and got a base hit. So the next day I didn't play again. I went in his office and said, I pretty much hit this guy pretty good today. How come I'm not playing? And he just said, well, you're my ace in the hole. And I hated it. You know, <laughs> it was just a time where I just wanted to get out there and play more, whatever it took for me to get out there and play. And, and just being in the major leagues, that was a big part of it. But you brought so much to a team. There's a reason guys play with seven, eight different teams, and that's not because uh, they're not good enough to stay on one team. It's because somebody else always wants them. And you brought stuff to a dugout and a clubhouse that was very important in terms of the way you intermingled with your teammates and maybe got on them from time to time and helped keep the clubhouse loose. Did you have that? in you naturally from the beginning of your career or did you have to develop that as you spent more time sitting in dugouts? No, I, I developed it at a young age and, and playing football in Miami. So um, my dad used to always say, hey, don't be a, a, lead, a follower, be a leader. So I always took that in perspective when I just felt that, you know, you got to get the guys up. You got to get the guys ready to play. You guys not playing that well. So it kind of carried me out through my career and just telling guys who even made more money than me and played every day, I was like, hey, if you don't feel like playing out there today, let me play, you know? And that's the way I was. So people start calling me a pretty much a clubhouse guy, toughness guy, and things like that. It wasn't that. It was just I was motivated to win, and, and I grew up winning. So I always wanted to win, and people always said, man, you've been through five, five postseasons in your career, and you only won one World Series. I said, some people never got the postseason. So, um, you know, it's just a big feeling by getting there to, to play in the fall class to, and see what it's all about. Mike Piazza is a guy that you got tight with in L.A., and then, of course, you wound up teammates with the New York Mets. What was the genesis of not only the teammate relationship with Mike, but what became pretty good friendship, too? I think the first time when he got called up in L.A., uh, he had this big, thick mustache going, and Brett Butler told him, hey, rookie, when are you going to cut that stash? And I looked at Brett, and I looked at Mike, and I, I said, you know, you shouldn't take that from anybody as big as you are, you know. And um, he said, yeah, you're right. Huh? And I said, yeah, don't take that from anybody. So next thing you know, Piazza started getting tougher, you know. And I was like, yeah, I kind of like that. I like that. And that's when we really start being closer together because he was like a big, smooth giant, you know. It's just sometimes you, you have to wake him up to get him going, mm -hmm. and when he got going, the monster, he just woke up and nothing can stop him. But sometimes you can see where he's really laid back and things like that, and I always go to him and say, you got to perform today. You got about 50,000 people here today. You got to put on a show. And he kind of liked it. He enjoyed it. So I always, I was always, always pretty much felt like I was that hype man to get him ready. So you knew how Blake to push I knew how to push him. I knew how to get him going, and when he got going, he got going. Did you have buttons that needed to be pushed, and could Mike push him? No, he couldn't push him. He couldn't push my button. Nobody can push my <laughs> button because I was already coming to the ballpark ready to play. I would think that you and Bobby Valentine probably had a pretty good relationship because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that he saw a lot of himself in you. What I mean by that is Bobby eventually became a bench player because he got hurt. He was supposed to be a, it was a great prospect until he hurt his leg. And then in the waning years of his playing career, you know, he would sit at the bench and really analyze what the manager was doing and, and what moves were being made within a game. And as you were such a presence within the clubhouse and the dugout, but also 
became a coach and, and thought the game along with just watching it. Did Bobby recognize that? And did you perhaps bond with him over any of that? Well, I, I, I really think that he kind of recognized it because I came to win. And, and, and one thing when I got to New York, people kept saying, you, everybody can't play in New York. And I, I kind of proved to them that I can play in New York because I like, I like the atmosphere. I, I, the people come and they expect us to play well. Do you mean specifically people said that they didn't think you could play in New York? Yeah, just Why? friends in Miami Why was would telling they think me, you, you know, because they said this is a big city, it's the Big Apple, you know, it's the mecca of sports and things like that. But you that. got a big personality too. Right. Why wouldn't they I think I really would... let them do, do all the talking, just like a lot of people say I would never play in the major leagues. So I was already in my own zone where I know anything was going to stop me was myself. But I didn't let nothing come between the lines with me doing what I have to do. So I kept doing it the way that Lenny Harris is supposed to do it and, and just never looked behind me. I just kept moving forward. And Bobby Valentine, Tommy Lasorda, and Jack McKeon was almost identical as a manager for me because they knew when they said, I have to put you in this lineup because this team is really slacking right now. And next thing you know, I get a start to boost this offense up, and next thing we get going again. And that's what it was all about. It was all about winning because, you know, you can't run a horse into the ground because we had too many great players. We had four guys in the infield win gold gloves that year. So that was unbelievable for that team that we had. So the defense was there. So it was defense and pitching that got us to the pennant. You know, we came a little short, but if anybody knows about the series, in 2000, we were winning every game. And next thing you know, we just ain't have enough a gas to put a, a big team away like the Yankees. When game two came around at Yankee Stadium, and again, you and Mike Piazza are pretty tight, and Clemens throws the bat at him, and nobody knows what's going to happen for about three or four what seemed like eternal seconds. Is it going to be a brawl in a World Series game? What were you thinking about? What did you think Mike was going to do, and what did you want to see happen? Well, I really thought they were going to fight because I thought he was throwing a bat at him and then he said he wasn't. But there was so many people out there intense. Everybody was really like going at it. We didn't really know what was going on. And we just ran out there. We was like, is he crazy? Do you remember after the World Series when Mike Hampton, who had been the MVP of the League Championship Series and was the pitcher that night, the night that Clemens threw the bat at Piazza, when Hampton left to go to the Colorado Rockies, there was a story that came out before the following season with a big he headline that said, Hampton, we should have fought. And I know that had to rub a few of your teammates the wrong way because Mike was the guy who had the baseball on his hand. If he thought that retaliation was necessary, he was in control of that show. Did it bother you that Mike seemed to sell out his teammates with that comment? No, not really, because like I said, it was a heat of the moment. Nobody really knew what was going on. He just threw the bat to the side, but Piazza swung his bat and didn't know where the ball went, so he had to run down the first yeah, baseline. He just line. happened to be in the Yeah, he just had to be right there, so he was like really throwing the bat away. But I didn't really think that had anything to do with our encouragement, the way we went about ourselves as a team, because if you really felt that way, Wherever you was, you should have ran out there and started fighting, you know. And I think that's what I think should have happened if he really felt that way. But, no, we was out there protecting our teammates, and, and that's what every club would do. But, like I said, it was very hard for us to tell, you know, how did it happen, why did it happen. And then when he, they asked him about it, he said it's just he was just intense, you know. He was, like, really fired up and things like that, which I can understand because – that's the kind of ball games that you have to play. You know, you have to go out there and play with intensity. You're trying to win. You're doing everything you can to win. And like I said, some people say it was an intimidation factor. I didn't see it as that. I just thought it was a part of the game. Well, you mentioned some of the managers you played for, and they're all pretty high-profile guys between Bobby Valentine, Tommy Lasorda, Buck Showalter, Jack McKeon who's one of the all-time throwbacks. I can't even imagine Jack trying to coexist in this era of analytics and dealing with front offices that want to dictate how you're supposed to run the game. But was there one of that whole group that you played for that you would consider your favorite or maybe the one you bonded best with? Well, it, it was amazing because I mentioned all those guys because I loved them. You know, they, they treated me like a gentleman. 
you know, when I first got to um, Arizona, Buck asked me how do I feel about the record. And I said, what record? He said, well, there's a, 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 a pitch it single season record is out. You got 26 pitch hits. The record is 28. And I told him, I said, well, it really doesn't bother me. I'm, I came here to win a championship. But if I get the opportunity to, to pitch it, I'm going to shatter that record, too. I'm going to break that record. Because if I can't get two hits in a month, something wrong. And I was really hot when I got, came from Colorado to Arizona. So I never got that opportunity. So people, a lot of people asked me about it. I said, no, that wasn't important to me. What was important to me is help the Diamondbacks win a championship. And that's why I came there. But records are kind of cool. So as, yeah. you, as you wound down towards tying and breaking the record, what was that like? Did you get a lot of attention for it, or was it something that only you really embraced? Matt Lawton was one of the guys kept harassing me about that. He kept here. saying, yeah, here. When he was here on that team, that 2000 team, and Joe McEwen said, man, I smell it. I smell it. <laughs> All those guys was hyping me up every day, and I was like, ah, don't worry about it. Bobby called me to hit. I saw my buddy was pitching, Carl Pavano, and I was like saying, oh, man, here he goes, a bunch of change-ups and things like that. So I said change-up fastball, which he's not overpowering. So I was pretty much sitting soft the whole time up there. I didn't think he could throw a ball 90 miles an hour by me. So, you know, um, he gave me the pitch. To make it a long story short, he gave me the pitch, and I hit it. And then we talked about it, and he said, man, it's amazing. I didn't gave up. 73 or 74 homers to Mark McGuire and gave you <laughs> the all-time pitch hit record in one year. So we played golf about it. We talked about it. But, you know, I say, hey, it's history. It's over with. Just think, if they ever show that film, they'll show you throw this ball yeah, to me and things like that. So what does we, it mean to you now, though? It means a lot, especially as I'm getting older. A lot of people always remind me of it and things like that. Even the 9-11 situation when we were here in New York, and when it happened, we was in Pittsburgh, and Bobby Valentine got everybody up, and we drove down here to Gotham. And um, it was a sad moment at that time, but everywhere I go, people always bring that up to me. So it always, even my kids, they always talk about New York, New York, New York. Daddy, we love New York. We love New York. So it always gives me chills when they talk about it. And then, like I said, when I, um, they asked me to do the Mets fantasy camp, it really gave me cheer bumps because I feel like I never left New York. You know, after all the years I played baseball, this is the only place that makes me feel at home. And fantasy camp connects oh, yeah, players definitely. with fans. And Def I'm not trying definitely. to do just a cheap commercial for Mets <laughs> fantasy camp. It's only going to be one of the best weeks of your life if you ever go down there. But exactly. you get to experience the fan adulation sort of in a more personal way than you could have as a player. Is that something that to this day touches you in a way that always. you couldn't have known when you played? Always, play? always, because I never felt the energy that how the people come down there and feel that energy about being a Met, you know, for a week or two and things like that. And they ask me, how you guys do it? How you guys do it? I never knew that I was going to have fun here plan for the Mets because when I came here I said man this is a tough environment to play in because every time like if Doc Gooden was pitching he got two strikes and Gary Carter was behind me he was like well Lenny you're in trouble <laughs> you know things like that so I really got nervous and stuff like that and then you know Doc could throw his pitch and send me back to the dugout but it didn't really bother me because he sent a bunch of us back to the dugout but like I said that was the energy to play in a, a, a town like this and one thing I can remember, too, when I got traded for Jeremy Burnett, and we were stretching at the time. And, and then he came over from and, Colorado? No, he came over from the Milwaukee Brewers. Oh, the second time. Yeah, okay. the second time. He came over, and he said, you want to come back to New York? Because I need to get out of here like that. I said, man, it's nothing like this place. You know, it's nothing like this place. You have to come to New York and play hard every night you know some cities you can towns you can take a day off and people don't really notice that you had an 0 for 4 night but you're going to hear it if you had an 0 for 4 here in new york so it's a different town but it's your favorite as you oh, mentioned. oh yeah oh and, yeah and um it's great to see you back in new york and to see the connection that you made not only with the mets but with their fans as well so lenny thanks for stopping hey, thank by thank you Appreciate it's a pleasure it. it's a definite pleasure to be back here in new york thank we'll you very see much at the fantasy camp lenny harris former new york met 
with us on One on One. I'm Howie Rose. We'll see you next time.